about Jesus. All about Jesus. All About Jesus is the audio ministry of Pastor John Hillebrand of Calvary Chapel in Bartlett, a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, God's Word, the Bible, is all about Jesus. Pastor John is currently teaching the church at Calvary Chapel, Bartlett, through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We are glad you have joined us today and invite you to open your Bible and your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit will say to us through the Word of God. And now, with today's message, here's Pastor John. The Gospel of John. And if anybody thinks that After the Gospel of John, we're going to go to the book of Acts. That's not what we're going to do. We, uh, as we studied through the New Testament several months ago, we began in Matthew. We went Matthew, Mark, Luke. And since Luke wrote Luke and Acts, after Luke we went to Acts. Because it's really kind of a two-parter. Not that we disagree with the way the Bible was laid out, but we just thought, okay, let's try this and see how it goes. And plus, it you know, just keeps us on our toes. So after Acts, we came back to John. So after John now, guess where we're going to go? To the book of Romans. That's right. But now we're in John chapter 18. It's unlikely we'll get through the rest of the gospel of John this morning. So let's just take what we have here. Verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. And Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to him, Whom are you seeking? And they said to him, Well, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said to them, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, saying, Whom are you seeking? And they said, "Uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was not known to, or was known to the high priest, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he answered, I am not. Now the servants and officers who made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine, and Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus 
with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? This is a side note. If I was Jesus, I would have flamed him right there and then. Anyway, and we're all glad I'm not Jesus. Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. Then one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied again, and immediately the rooster crowed. Now, John 18, verse 1, begins with, When Jesus had spoken these words, referring to what he had been teaching the disciples ever since chapters 13 through 17. And by the way, his teaching there all took place in one night. It was the night of the Passover, during which Jesus also instituted the communion service. As he broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And afterward, he took the cup of wine and he, he blessed it and he said, Take, drink from this, all of you. For this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So the communion service, which, by the way, we're going to celebrate next Sunday, the communion service is really a memorial service. For in it, we remember Jesus. Jesus who paid for our sins by dying on the cross, allowing his body to be broken and his blood shed, that through his blood, all of our sins should be cleansed. Well, after the supper had ended, Jesus began discussing things with his disciples and teaching them about many things, all of which emanated from his great commandment, which we read in John 15, verse 12, which is, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So if all of his teachings are like the spoke on a tire, the hub from which all of his teachings emanate is his command to love one another as he has loved us. So for interpreting the scripture, it always comes back to that premise that we are to love one another as he has loved us. Now, most of his teachings, as you know, took place on the way from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. But now in chapter 18, Jesus has finished teaching his disciples. And at this point, they begin to walk down the Temple Mount, from the Temple Mount area, down into the Kidron Valley, and then back up again on the western slope of the Mountain of Olives, where there was a garden, which was called Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means oil press. And it was there that Jesus truly was pressed as he agonized over what he knew lay in store for him. But just for a little bit of a picture reference, Mike, you want to pull that up, please? Here you have the Temple Mount today. Here's the Dome of the Rock. Here is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is a dome that's been overlaid with gold, and this one has been overlaid with silver. And it's believed that the original temple stood right about here in this area. And here's the Eastern Gate, which makes a lot of sense because it lines up with the old eastern gate. Go to the next picture. Here you have, looking from the Mount of Olives, there's the eastern gate where the original temple would have been, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. You might wonder, what are all these? Those are all tombs. Those are graves. Jewish people that pay a whole lot of money to be buried on the Mount of Olives here. And they're all buried facing the same direction. All their feet are facing toward the eastern gate so that in their belief when the Messiah comes and they know the scriptures from the Old Testament how he's going to step foot on the Mount of Olives and then he's going to walk into the eastern gate well when he comes they believe they're going to be resurrected they're going to sit up and face that direction and then walk with him in triumph over his enemies through the eastern gate that's why they desire to be buried in this very expensive piece of ground. Go to the next picture. Okay, there's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. No, the, the, the next one, the third one. That's two. There's three. Here's the Al-Aqsa Mosque again. Now we're on the other side. Those grave sites we saw were over here. We were looking this way. Now we're looking the other direction. This whole hill area is called the Mount of Olives, where there used to be a lot of olive trees. 
And you'll notice this Russian Orthodox church that's the onion skin tops that, that is overlaid in, in real gold. And, and, you know, sometimes we criticize Christian churches and how they're built and the money that's spent. And believe me, we scrimped and saved every penny on this building as it is obvious. Go to the next one, please. <laughs> and there's that Russian Orthodox Church again. This is a Catholic church. And they believe that this is where uh, the Garden of Gethsemane actually stood. Of course, you've got the Protestants over here that have more of a garden-like setting who believe that that is where the Garden of Gethsemane really was. And so they bicker and fight all the time on, on where the actual garden was. Who cares? Jesus was somewhere in this area and there was a garden at the time and there were olive trees. Thank you, Mike, for showing us those. Mike, you did a fabulous job. Everybody give Mike a hand. There you go. Now, as we read through chapters 18 and on, we read that John did not record every single event that happened there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the other gospel writers wrote things that John didn't recorded things that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane that John didn't. But John recorded some things that the others didn't. So if you want to have the big picture, what actually happened there, it would be really helpful to read all of the gospel accounts of this evening's events. Now in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 18, we read about Judas betraying Jesus. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, John at this point does not record what the other gospel writers do. The fact that all of the disciples fell asleep when Jesus was praying to his father. It's interesting that Matthew and Mark specifically even call out Peter, James, and John, along with the other disciples, but specifically mentions those remedial three, that special ed class of Jesus. And how he mentions them by name who fell asleep. So no wonder John doesn't record Jesus' prayer in the garden. He was, he was unconscious. He was out to lunch at that time. But the other gospel writers do record. Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples falling asleep. And they also record Jesus' rebuke of them. And he said, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yesterday morning, I challenged the men at our men's breakfast that the most important service we have, I believe, personally, is our prayer fellowship that meets Sunday nights. And how important it is that we, as a body of Christ, gather together as often as we can to seek the Lord in prayer. If you haven't been to a prayer fellowship, you're missing out. I encourage you to come on out. If you haven't been to one for a while, come on back. Let's pour our hearts out to God. Let's seek the Lord for, for what He desires to do in us and through us. And let's see if God doesn't do some pretty awesome things. You know, every time God's people pray, God does amazing things. He always says, never lets us down. We never leave a prayer service thinking, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. Never leave a time of prayer, maybe in your own personal devotions. Have you ever you know, stopped reading the Bible and stopped praying and walked away and thought, man, that was a waste of time. No, you're always blessed by doing it, aren't you? And so if you're available, if, if you happen to be in the area and you're here tonight around 6.30, come on out. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. May we not be sleeping when we should be praying. In verses 2 and 3, we notice that the Jewish religious rulers are now siding with their enemies, the Roman government. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. That, that uh, detachment of troops, it's the Greek word spira which is a number between a, a, a troop that would number between 200 and 1,600 soldiers. It means that they didn't just show up with a few guys. It was like this whole army invaded the Garden of Gethsemane at that time. But notice that you have Jews now working with these Gentiles. And, and, and why? They hated one another. The Jews despised the Roman occupation. But we see here, once again, Jesus unites. 
He unites believers. He prayed in John 17 that all of us believers would be one. And we are one. We are all in agreement over him. We love him and therefore love one another. But we also see how that enemies of God are also united in their hatred of Jesus Christ. And they'll put aside their differences in order that they might come against Jesus and his people. But you know what? Even the combined forces of the world are no match for the Lord Jesus Christ and those who belong to him. If you're worried about the enemy coming against you, let me remind you of Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. You want something from the New Testament? 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. Period. End of story. We win. You want more? I'm glad you asked. In the book of Revelation, at the very end of time, we read this incredible section here. When the thousand years, a millennial kingdom, you know there's going to be the rapture of the church, a seven-year tribulation, then a thousand-year rule and reign of Christ where we are in our glorified bodies and we're ruling and reigning over, over those who survived the tribulation and their descendants and so forth. But then there's going to come an end of those thousand years. And during that thousand years, Satan is held in, in chains of darkness. He's, he's reserved until the day of judgment. But then at the thousand years, he's let loose. And we read, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, you and me, the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem there. And, and I love this. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It's remarkable, and we, we can't get into the details, but it's remarkable to me that after a thousand years of no pain and suffering, of peace and harmony, that, that people at that point would want to follow Satan. After all the good things that God has done, you know, and, and we're going to, in our glorified bodies, of course, we're not going to be lured over to that, but we're going to scratch our heads. Why would you want to do that? Haven't you experienced, you know, many years of peace and glory? And, and why would you want something different? It's a mystery. Satan is seductive. Let's make no mistake about that. He doesn't knock on your door and you open up and there's some guy in red long underwear and a pointy tail and, and horns and a pitchfork. Hi, I'm the devil. I want to mess up your life. You ready? Not that he would have a southern accent, but, you know, <laughs> he'd probably would say, yo, way, yo, I'm going to mess up your life. You know, maybe New Yorkers. I don't know. Or California, dude. Yeah. But he doesn't do that. He's subtle. He's sneaky. But he always uses the same things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of his temptations boil down to those things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So if it appeals to your flesh, if it pleases your eyes, and you think, wow, this is going to make me look really cool. Warning. Danger. Warning. Watch out. There's the devil trying to get you. But the combined forces, no match for Jesus. Fire comes down from heaven. Whoosh! They're crispy critters. It's over. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then, of course, you read about the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem descending from the throne of God. And that'll be after the thousand-year tribulation and this momentary rebellion. So, 200 to 1,600 men were there to arrest Jesus. Combined forces of the enemy. No match for Jesus. Notice what he did. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? And they said, you just kind of see, you know, picture in your mind their great arrogance and we're in control and don't mess with me. I'm the law. And they said, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And then he said to them, I am he, or literally, I am. Yahweh, Jehovah, the all-becoming one, the great I am. He took that name upon himself. And when he did, says that Judas, uh, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he said to them, I am, 
they drew back and fell to the ground. Not only did Jesus call himself by the divine name, but he also manifested his divine power by knocking them back on their backsides. Just his power leveled them, flattened them out. Why did he do that? Well, he wanted them to know who was really in control. He wanted them to realize, oh yeah, you've come with me with clubs and swords and spears and, and all this stuff. You're no match for me. I'm in control here, and you better do what I say. Well, as they picked themselves up from the ground, began to dust themselves off, Jesus said to them again, whom are you seeking? And you can just picture the kind of the, the color rushing from their faces and nervously now some, them saying, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, please don't, not again. Jesus answered, I have told you, that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these, speaking of his disciples, go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of these whom you gave me, I have lost none. He was praying to the Father in chapter 17. Those whom you've given me, I've lost none of them except for the son of perdition, except for Judas, of course. Well, apparently one of the main reasons for Jesus manifesting his power was to show them that he was in charge that he was in control, thus ensuring that his disciples wouldn't be arrested with him. See, Jesus is always caring, always ministering to his disciples regardless of the situation. And so God knocked the enemies back that he might make his people go free. I love it. Simon Peter, however, God bless him. Good old Peter. I identify with him. He's always opening his mouth and inserting his foot. Some say he suffered from athlete's tongue. He's all the time putting his foot in his mouth. Likes to act and ask questions later. Go bang, bang, freeze. You know, kind of in reverse. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And then John says his, the servant's name was Malchus. Hey, I give Peter an A for effort, but an F for execution. Kind of see the, the joke there, execution, as Peter's trying to execute the guy, but he didn't. As we read in Scripture, Peter really wasn't that great of a fisherman. Apparently, he was even a worse swordsman. Tried to cut the guy's head off and just kind of glanced and got an ear. But at least Peter's trying. And I got to give him credit for that. He's backing up what he said earlier. He said to Jesus, hey, even if these forsake you, I will never forsake you. Jesus said, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. He said, if even if I have to die for you, I will never forsake you. I'll never deny you. And he was saying that he would, he would die for, lay his life down. Well, here's 200 to 1,600 Roman soldiers and Peter's standing up and there's only Jesus and 11 disciples. One of them had defected. So 12 against 200 to 1,600, Peter's going to go for it. I like Peter. I like him. But he wasn't exactly doing things within God's timing. <laughs> Notice that Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given to me? You know, what Peter did goes to show us that many times, like us, Peter should have been praying when he was sleeping. And also, he should have been sleeping when he was swinging. So, He was sleeping when he should have been praying and swinging and fighting when he should have been sleeping or at rest or doing something else. And that's why the Lord said, put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Notice that, the cup, what cup? Well, in Luke 22, we read about Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Ultimately, the cup was the cross and all that was entailed, not just the physical suffering, 
but also the separation that Jesus at that only one time in his life ever experienced when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is believed at that moment, all of the sins of humanity, yours and mine, past, present, and future, were poured forth upon Jesus. And because sin separates us from God, Jesus experienced something that he had never experienced before, separation from the Father. Oh, sure, the pain and the torture that he went through were enough for him to pray, I don't want to do this. Is there another way? Let this cup pass from me. But that mental anguish, that spiritual anguish of separation from the Father was something that Jesus just trembled, labored over, so much so that as his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood. Well, ultimately, that, that cup was the cross, and Jesus drank it down to the dregs. Hey, if good works could save a person, why did Jesus go to the cross? If you or I could be justified by sincerely believing one's religion of choice, doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you're sincere, then why did Jesus go to the cross? According to God, there was no other way. Jesus had to die to become a curse for us that we, through believing in him, might become righteous in him. The exchange is so wonderful. Our sins for his righteousness. Hey, we win. We win big. Have you experienced that, by the way? Have you made the trade? Have you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, that your sins would be taken completely from you and his righteousness would be completely upon you? So Jesus said, I got to drink this. No other way. Put your sword away. It's not time to fight. It's time to surrender to the Father's will. Jesus allowed himself to be arrested, but made sure that his disciples got away. In verse 12, Jesus is then brought before the Jewish religious rulers. And also during that same time, it's like a two-scene thing. You have some of it taking place before Annas, the high priest, and then Peter over here and back and forth. It's, it's quite fascinating. Verse 12, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. They led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. <coughs> Annas was the rightful high priest by birth. But since Rome was in charge, and at one time he had fallen out of favor with the Roman government, they decided they would rather have his son-in-law Caiaphas as the officially recognized high priest. In fact, Annas had at least four other sons who at one time or another reigned as high priest. There was only supposed to be one at one time. And the man was supposed to, according to the law of Moses, he was supposed to occupy the, the office of high priest until he died. And then his firstborn son would become the high priest. But since there were two high priests at this time, and since Rome was calling the shots, this was an indication that Israel had gotten far away from God and from his word. The religious rulers had forsaken the scriptures, and as a result... They now had two high priests, one very corrupt and one a mere puppet. Why did they do this? Well, Jesus accused them of holding fast to their traditions and their culture and their customs and thus nullifying the word of God. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, you've made the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. We need to be on guard. Because there are many traditions that are not biblical. There are many beliefs that have been held over the years and years and years and years that are just not biblical. And we have to make a choice. Will we obey what the clear teaching of Scripture says or are we going to hold fast to our traditions and culture? I remember growing up in a very religious church. As many of you know, I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. And I asked, how come? I asked the priest several questions, and I was really wearing out my welcome, I know. But, you know, 15 years old and starting to read the Bible, and wait a second. I said to, to Father uh, Keith, hey, man, how come? I didn't say hey, man, but, but uh, Father, how come you say that the church is supposed to call you Father, but Jesus clearly said, call no man Father, for you only have one Father, and that's your Father in heaven. And he's specifically speaking about 
uh, about calling men in spiritual positions, calling them your father. I say, well, how come Jesus said don't, but yet the church says do? And his response was, well, it's been a tradition in the church. We believe that we are the true church and, and that Jesus instituted. And since it's been a tradition so long, we believe that God has changed his mind. And I said, well, then what about the issue where in 1 Timothy we read there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, but yet you in the church teach us that we're to pray to uh, dead saints and to pray to, your, to Jesus, his mother Mary, and pray to others uh, through them to God. But yet the Bible says we're only supposed to pray in the name of Jesus. He said, again, it's a tradition. And because it's been a tradition so long, we believe God has changed his mind. And he went on to say, and John, stop reading the Bible. You're just not qualified like we are to correctly interpret the scriptures. You don't tell a 15-year-old what not to do because he'll do the opposite. I say, well, if they're hiding that, what else are they hiding? And I started, to, whoa, it was amazing. That's just one of, of many examples, even in the, the Christian church. You know, women have to wear dresses. Why? I agree. Yes, we must wear clothes. You know, absolutely. Don't come to church unclothed. That would be bad. But does it have to be a certain style? That's all culture. But yet, if you feel you're more spiritual because... You wear a certain thing or... And there are some who go the opposite extreme. They think they're more spiritual because they wear T-shirts, shorts, and sandals. Well, you know, I'm really close to God because I'm not hung up on that stuff. Yeah, but that's not right either. All that stuff is immaterial. We just must be careful that we don't allow our traditions, our cultures, to make the Word of God of no effect. And whatever the Bible says, that's what we go by. So the tradition, the religious rulers, they had forsaken the word of God. That's why they had two high priests. May we not allow that to happen. Verse 14, so Annas was listening to him. He was a father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the official Roman high priest of the time. Now it was that Caiaphas, verse 14, who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This is back in John chapter 11. The religious rulers are gathered together. And they say, what are we going to do with this Jesus guy? He's done a lot of miracles and a lot of people are going after him. They're leaving us to go after him. And Caiaphas said, you do not know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. And the Holy Spirit through John says, now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, not only for that nation also, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are gathered or who are scattered abroad. So, Annas, a rightful one, first heard Jesus. Later on, he sent him to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who was the official high priest. As he's being carried off to Annas, we read, Simon Peter followed Jesus. According to Mark 14, verse 54, we read that he followed Jesus at a distance. That's key Because following Jesus at a distance is a quick way for a great fall. Quick way to fall quickly when you're following Jesus at a distance. But Simon Peter followed him and so did another apostle. Now that disciple, that other apostle, was not known to the, or excuse me, was known to the high priest. He was familiar with the high priest. And he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Who was this other disciple? We don't know. Some suggest John. John has a habit in his gospel of writing about himself in the third person. Also, John mentions the high priest's servant by name. How did he know that? He must have at least known servants of the high priest, maybe even the high priest. There's one who speculated, a commentator, who said that John and his family operated a fishing business up in Galilee. And that's very clear. The scripture says so. It could very well be, though, that since they didn't have refrigeration, they, of course, salted the fish down to preserve it. It could be that John was the one who would bring fish down to Jerusalem because there were a lot of people there and a big demand for fish. And so, and by the way, the Jordan River only has catfish in it. And according to the Jews, they can't eat catfish because it doesn't have both uh, fins and scales. It just has fins but, but no scales. So it's unclean. 
And when we were there in Israel, there at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee where it empties out in the Jordan River, we were, there's a big baptismal area that Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa had built years ago. And several of us were down there with lots of other groups and baptizing in the Jordan. It was really cool. But I had a bag of potato chips. And I was throwing them in the water. And out of the depths came these two, three, four, five, six-foot catfish. I was like, oh, for a fishing pole, you know. And the Jews don't eat them. So they don't get their fish out of the Jordan River. They get their fish out of the Sea of Galilee. And it could be John was the guy who brought fish down to Jerusalem and no doubt had contact with the high priest. I don't know. We don't know if this was John, this other disciple, or not. Could be. Then again, it could be somebody else. Doesn't matter. But just throw that out there as food for thought since we're talking about catfish. Verse 16. But Peter stood at the door outside. He wasn't allowed in. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. And the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Denial number one. One strike against him. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Anybody see a problem with that? Anybody see maybe you're, 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 you're on dangerous ground here? I think it is a problem that Peter is warming himself at the enemy's fire. And if I might hyper-spiritualize a little bit here and stretch things a bit, let me just say that the enemy does have many warm, inviting, entertaining fires that are burning for the world to enjoy. But as the saying goes, he who plays with fire is going to get burnt. It is our prayer, all of us, that we would be open and honest before God and ask ourselves, hey, have I been warming myself up by the enemy's fire? Am I getting too close? Have I compromised in some way, whether it be through the movies or the music or or just the entertainment industry at large, am I warming myself by the enemy's fire? Because the bottom line is, the longer we hang out by the enemy's fire, the more likely we are to get burnt. So may God search our hearts. May we come to that conclusion that whatever God has condemned, as entertaining as it might be, whatever God has condemned, we ought not to have anything to do with it. In verses 19 through 24, Jesus is finally questioned by Annas. We leave Peter's scene and we go now back to the, to the high priest. The high priest then asks Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. They're trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself. But Jesus answered him, Hey, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Hey, ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they will know what I said. I have no hidden agendas. I say what I mean. I mean what I said. And whatever I've said in public, that's who I am. Well, apparently his answer made some of them, all of them, really mad. Verse 22, when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, Do you dare answer the high priest like that? Hey, my question to him would be, Do you dare strike the God of the universe like that? You know, this trial... According to Jewish law, according to the religious ruler's own law, was illegal on so many levels. Number one, it was held at night, which was illegal. You can only hold a trial with a person during the daylight, when most people would be up and able to give a defense. Secondly, they struck him before a verdict was given. You could not inflict any punishment upon a person until the verdict was given. And if you did inflict punishment, whatever punishment you inflicted upon a person before he was guilty, that same punishment would be levied back upon you. Stripe for stripe, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, blow for blow. So it was illegal to have it at night, illegal for this man to hit Jesus before they had come to a conclusion. And Jesus turned to him and he answered him, verse 23, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. What did I say? What evil did I say? But if well, if I've said what's good, then why do you strike me? It's a good question. Then Annas 
Send him bound to Caiaphas, the other high priest. Well, at this point, the other gospels record Jesus being mocked and beaten by those religious rulers. How they blindfolded him, struck him in the face and said, prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemy spoke against him. Now, back to, to Simon Peter. Verse 25, Simon Peter stood and warmed himself again at the enemy's fire. Therefore, they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? You know, why are you here? I remember uh, years ago when I was warming myself at the enemy's fire at San Diego State University. I was there one semester. Academic probation and lots of other carnal issues. After that one semester, I decided I need to go back where I belonged. Well, I was hanging out with some ungodly people and doing a few ungodly things. As a believer in Jesus Christ, but yet backslidden. I'll be honest. I was backslidden. It might come as a shock to you but then you might come as a shock to me. So anyway, uh, at the end of the semester, finally somebody said something. And I said, I'm a Christian. He said, you're a Christian? I said, well, yeah, why? Why does that surprise you? He goes, well, that's weird. Most Christians I know are a lot different from me, but you're no different than I am. Ah, that hurt. Why? Because I had been warming myself at the enemy's fire been indulging in the things the enemy was doing, hanging out with them, being sucked in with them. And as a result, a broken heart, fleeing from my spiritual life. So they said, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. Denial number two. Then one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him who's whose ear Peter cut off. Oh, it's just it's just too good right here. Here you got the guy who's a relative of the guy whose ear was cut off, and he was also there at the time. He looks at Peter. Hey, I know you. Wait a second. Wait a second. You are that guy. Did I not see you in the garden with him? Busted. And Peter denied again and Bible in, in the other gospel said he began to curse and swear. Blankety blank, I don't know what the blank you're talking about. And don't fill in the blank. Peter denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. The denial number three. Luke's gospel tells us at that point. It was when Jesus was being led away from Annas to Caiaphas there across the courtyard and his eyes and Peter's eyes looked at each other. Rooster crowed, Peter turns, there's Jesus looking right at him. Oh, can't imagine the look that Jesus gave Peter. I know it wasn't one of, how dare you, you let me down. Hey, he's God. He knew the end from the beginning. He even told Peter that before this night is out, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. It might have been a, told you so. It might have been one of love and compassion. Peter, it's going to be okay. I know you're hurting now, but it's going to be okay. And indeed, Peter did hurt. He went out and wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. Isn't it interesting? A relative of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, recognized him. Which reminds me of the warning that Moses gave to Israel. Be sure of this, your sin will find you out. In the book of Proverbs, whoever covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. It's only a matter of time. And don't think that just because God has allowed you to go on in a certain particular sin that somehow he's given you a seal of approval. No, do not at all confuse his patience with his approval. Because he's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And maybe today the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe now you realize, oh, man, God has been patient with me. He doesn't approve. He's been patient. Well, what do I do now? Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Turn from your sin. Turn to the Lord. And he will forgive you. He will heal you. He will restore you. Just as he did with Peter. After he rose from the dead, he went to Peter. And three times he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Lord, 
Yeah, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Well, Lord, you know that, that, that I, I, I love you. Tend my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Well, you know that I have at least great affection for you. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times. How many times did Jesus reaffirm Peter? Three times. I don't think it was an accident. But you know, I can just imagine that later on in life, Peter must have had those shoulda, woulda, coulda moments. You know what they are? I should have done this. I would, if, I, if I could go back, I would do this. Uh, you ever have those moments of regret? I have them all the time. You know, I'm laying in bed at night and thinking, oh, junior high, oh, I shoulda, woulda, coulda, you know? Or high school, oh, why didn't I? Oh, and I said that, and why? Oh, I wish I could take it back, and oh, you know. I'm sure we all go through those times. Times like Peter when those three denials haunted him. And, you know, the tradition is, uh, of, of church history is, is kind of sometimes humorous because there is a tradition how Christians later on, when P all was said and done and Peter was going out preaching to churches and, and, and all, there's a tradition that when Peter would be introduced to speak that some in the congregation would welcome him by crowing. <laughs> you, know, you know how nice Christians can be. And it was probably done in good nature. And now Simon Peter, ar, 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 you know, and, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately Peter did deny the Lord three times. Why? Why did he do? What, was, what were the reasons for his great fall? There, there are four things I want to put out there. Number one, pride. Remember how Peter said, though the rest would forsake you, I will never forsake you. I will never deny. I will die for you if I have to. That's pride. Number two, slothfulness. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. Number three, following Jesus at a distance. Never a good thing. Number four, warming himself at the enemy's fire. All this was a recipe for disaster that it ended up with Peter getting really burnt and no doubt later on in life having moments of great regret. I can't go back and unscramble my eggs that I've, uh, I've scrambled. I can't undo those regrets. I just have to trust the scriptures which says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. So praise the Lord for his wonderful do-over to us all. But from this point forward, I don't want to do anything that would bring forth great Regret. I want to learn from Peter's example of what not to do. Instead of pride, I want to be humble. God forbid in Galatians 6 verse 14, but God forbid that I should boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. If we must boast, let us boast in the cross of Jesus Christ, not in, in our strength. And instead of slothfulness, I want to be diligent in prayer. As we read in Ephesians 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I admit, prayer, does, prayer, prayer is work. You know, worshiping the Lord in song, that, that sometimes is a lot easier than just praying. But it's like any muscle, the more you exercise it, the easier it'll get. And so may we pray with all diligence and perseverance. So instead of pride, humility, instead of slothfulness, I want to be diligent in prayer. Instead of following Jesus at a distance, I want to be as close to him as I can possibly be. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. So wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. I want to be as close to him as I can be. If anyone serves me, he said, him my father will honor. So instead of pride, humility, instead of slothfulness, diligence in prayer, instead of following Jesus at a distance, being as close to him as we can possibly be, and instead of warming ourselves at the enemy's fire, I'd rather be cold. I, would, I, I, I want to, from this point on, choose rather to be cold than to warm myself at the enemy's fire. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. 
You know, that whole what would Jesus do? We need to determine and find out what's acceptable to God. As I was talking earlier with somebody, would Jesus uh, enjoy his bowl of popcorn and watch certain types of movies? Would Jesus be there, oh yeah, this is great. Or would he have a hard time? Would he not enjoy his popcorn at that point? And if he wouldn't enjoy his popcorn, then we probably ought not to either. We need to find out what is acceptable to the Lord. And he goes on to say, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And only you can determine what truly is the enemy's fire or not. I can't lay that trip on you. I try, but then I become legalistic. And then you might come back at me and say, yeah, John, but what about this? And it's true. Whenever you point the finger at somebody, you got three coming back at you. See? Right there. Three coming right back at you. Only you can determine what is acceptable and what is questionable. But I guarantee you, if you're reading the Word of God and you're praying that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you what is acceptable and what is not, He will put a check in your spirit those times you decide or, or, or desire to go and check out what the enemy is doing and, and promoting. Those questionable things, God will make it very clear to you. And then, through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we obey him when he puts that check in our heart. So, by his grace and mercy, may he speak to us today that he might shape us and mold us into his image, that we might live lives that are pleasing to him, that we might walk practically in that which we are positionally, which is holy and righteous before him. Shall we pray? Thank you, God, for this time in your word. Lord, we've been challenged. I know I've been challenged. I'm, things in my mind, things that I've allowed and wonder, is this right? Is this good? Is this something you enjoy? Is something you are thrilled with? Or is this something you say, wait a second, that's a work of the flesh. So, Lord, Search me. Lord, I know that we we trust you to search all of us, but Lord, for me right now, search me. Try me, know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Lord, we agree with David that he would, would, would beg of you to search his heart and try him so that he would be able to walk with you in righteousness and truth and holiness, having nothing questionable in his life. Nothing that the enemy could raise his eyebrow at, like what happened to me so many years ago. And forgive me, God, for that. I'm so sorry. The enemy raising his eyebrow saying, Oh, you're a Christian? You're just like me. Lord, we are different. Very different based on you. So, Lord, again, we just lay ourselves before you. Say, the will of the Lord be done. Convict where we need convicting. Encourage where we need encouragement. Set us free and at liberty where we need to have freedom and liberty. May the will of the Lord be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're glad that you could join us today for our study of God's Word. If you would like to have a cassette or CD copy of today's Bible study in its entirety, mail your request with the day of this broadcast and the scripture reference to Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. That address again is Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. Our service times are Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m., Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are located in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett at 8587 Memphis Arlington Road. For more information about Calvary Chapel Bartlett, please call us at area code 901-385-3854. That number again is area code 901-385-3854. You may also visit us online at calvarychapelbartlett.com. Again, that's calvarychapelbartlett.com. Our hope and prayer is that we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again at this same time, Monday through Friday, as we continue to study the entire Bible, which is all about Jesus. All about Jesus.